We're going to start. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the season opener of Nats Chat 2019-2020. I'm Kari Reagan. I'm the organizer and host, um, which are sponsored by Inside View Press. We are so grateful for Scott McCoy and Inside View Press, who began sponsoring the webinars of Nats Chats about four years ago. And I'm thrilled for this wonderful season. I have many wonderful guests starting with tonight, which we are talking about discovering your niche market with Jerry Ellsbert, Dana Lentini, and Cynthia Vaughn. Welcome the three of you and thank you for joining me. And let's begin with talking a little bit about Beyond the Bio. So Jerry, why don't you just share with us a little bit about what we wouldn't read about in your bio? Well, I can tell you one thing you wouldn't read about is that when I graduated college, I was going to be a choral director. And um, I was in my student teaching experience when uh, my supervising teacher asked me to take one of the young tenors into a practice room and work on one of the solos that he was going to be doing in an upcoming concert. So we disappeared and I worked. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, never taught a voice lesson in my life. And we disappeared and came back 20 minutes later and he sang his solo and Jaws in the room dropped and a career was born. <laughs> so oh, from that, that point, yeah, I, I thank my supervising teacher. I actually saw him at a former voice students uh, or voice teacher's funeral earlier this year and thanked him for what he started because that's what really kind of instilled in me the love of teaching voice Isn't that amazing, those moments that change a life? I just find that right. astounding. Yes. I know in master classes at the university, I'll sometimes have my graduates take over for a few minutes. And it's in that process that I know that some of them have the same thing. The love of teaching suddenly took hold of them. Mm -hmm. Dana, how about you? A little beyond the bio? Beyond the bio. Hmm. There's a couple interesting ones, but I think Maybe going back, way back when I was an undergrad and I had a part-time job, I used to do singing telegrams for a company called Eastern Onion. And I went to school in LA, I went to USC to do my undergrad. And so this was like a job that you could not do today because I would get like the call of the job that I would have to do and I would have to go to strange places and go in and sing birthday messages to people. And one day I was called to go into this very unusual building that was in Santa Monica. Um, it was like a warehouse and I went in and there was video cameras everywhere. It was under very high security. I was getting ready. I was in my little French maid outfit, ready to sing my little song <laughs> with my feather duster. Oh boy. And um, wouldn't you know, I was doing a singing telegram for Sylvester Stallone. Oh, wow. so, <laughs> so that was one of my brushes with stardom or at least with a movie star. So <laughs> I, so I sang for Sylvester Stallone. I love that. And that's not in my bio. <laughs> <laughs> you need to work it in somehow. Yes, I probably should. Cynthia, how about you? Well, I wasn't sure what I was going to say for my Beyond the Bio, but Jerry's comment just immediately sparked a memory that's not in my bio, but when I was Cal State Hayward, as I was um, we're getting a little delay there. We are. Mm -hmm. you're, Do I need back. to come Mike, okay, I'm back. Okay. Um, but when I was a senior vocal performance major and all, all I wanted to do was perform. In fact, if people would say, well, why aren't you getting an education degree? And I said, I don't want to be a choral director. Although I've been a choral director many times since. At the time, it was like, I, I am going to be a performer. And my senior year in college, um, uh, unfortunately for my instructor, but fortunately for me, uh, my teacher had an an illness where he had to take a, a leave of absence for about six weeks. And during that time, they, they didn't bring in another instructor. There wasn't budget for that. Um, but so the, the more advanced students, we studied with the other faculty. But he came to me and he said, Cynthia, would you work with all of the freshman sopranos 
while I'm away. Would you teach their lessons? And and he says, you can play the piano. You you know you know this repertoire. You sang it three years ago. And and I thought, oh, oh I don't know if I can teach a singing lesson, but um, I'll give it a try. And, and of course, I absolutely loved it. And then when the teacher came back in fine health, none of the little sopranos wanted to go back to him, but they had to. <laughs> not the one with the job. Again, I, I don't know if that was completely legal, but it worked out great for me. And it, I will say right then and there, my love of, of teaching um, what probably started. So thanks, Jerry. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, yes, Jerry, you kind of launched a, a thought for me too as we mentor younger teachers. It's, mm -hmm. I have to say, I like you, Cynthia, I had no intentions of being a teacher, but my college teacher, um, my first college teacher at 19 got me a job at a local high school teaching voice after, after classes. And, um, and it's how I've made my living since then but I was never going to be a teacher, right? And it was many years later that I embraced that. But I do see this younger generation, they're so much more intelligent during college to know that there's a reality to pursuing a profession as a singer solely. And they seem to be a little more savvy about it, which, which makes it easier to prepare them, I think. Are you, do you notice that in the young people that you teach? Yes, I do. I mean, I, I've had people tell me, why do you teach primarily high schoolers? And my answer always is because I love them. They're, they, they're way too, so they're sold too short a lot of the time. They're very intelligent people. They're coming into their own. They have a beautiful idealism about life and the world. And to be a little part of that, to help them develop who they are, mm -hmm. I think it's one of the best jobs in the world. We really give life lessons through music, don't we? I mean, that's so much of our job. We digress, so let me get us back on our niche market conversation. Uh, Cynthia, you first of all, and I want to thank Cynthia, who every year, this is I think our fourth or third year together doing this. She always steps in so that we make sure we focus one of the chats specifically for independent studio teachers and she helps me find the guests and organize it and all of that. So thank you, Cynthia. Um, and then you're so clever because you did your wonderful Facebook video tonight to help promote it. So thank you for that. You mentioned in that video though about the discover what you call the discovery process. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Sure. So like uh, most of my colleagues and probably many independent studio teachers, um, it, when we first start out, we we want to make money. We'll, we'll teach whoever is available. Um, I was always very comfortable teaching high school students because I wasn't that much older than they were when I first started teaching. And so it's like I, I understood young voices. And, and as I as I grew older, I still I, you know, I, I have teenagers in my studio now. Some of them I help prepare for college. Some are uh, in their high school choir. So so that's pro at least a third of my studio now. But what happened over time is that um, I, I wasn't sure how to teach adults and I didn't think they would take me seriously. And I found out that just the fact that I had a music degree that already gave me some street cred. It's like, oh, she's studied this. She must be good. Um, true or not. Um, but so, so that gave me a little bit of confidence and I started doing uh, like workshops for choirs, uh, church choir groups. And, and I realized that I work very well with people who are older than I am. And um, out of those choral workshops, I would get um, requests, oh, do you teach voice lessons to adults? And so I started, uh, I'm still many years ago, taking on a few adults. And over time, I say it's a discovery because there was about 10 years in there where I was teaching exclusively college students, 18 to 22 year olds, classical vocal, lots of Schubert and Italian and opera arias. And when I left the university and started um, a full-time studio again, I got to choose this time, instead of just taking 
everybody and anybody, I really got to think about my skill set, my personality, who, who do I relate well to? And of course, it was still teenagers, but I found myself more and more attracted to teaching adult students. Um, and I will say now, I do very well with baby boomers and retired students. Um, so I still relate well to, I think, singers who are my age or even a little bit older. Um, I do have some students in their, their uh, 20s and 30s, but most of my adult students are 50s to 80s. And one of the things that I learn from those students who are, who are older than I am is I, they teach me about mindful aging. Mm -hmm. And part of my job or my, my opportunity is to, just to say, yes, you don't have the same voice that you did when you sang in high school choir and um, uh, you got to go on this choir trip with your school and you were the soloist and you know you don't have that voice. Let's explore the voice that you have now. And quite often that means we're choosing completely different repertoire. We're definitely choosing different ranges, um, but we can always find something that the students, the adult students will just really excel at. And I, well, it's just been a real pleasure for me. And there's so much science to support oh. seeing into mm you know, our later years, both from a respiratory function and a cognitive function. And I, you know, that should be such a target market for singing teachers, really. Um, well, and and I, there are resources for teachers now for that particular age group. I, I Brunson, Karen Brunson's new book, Singing for the Ages, and it is, it just should be on every voice teacher's piano, whether you teach, uh, you know, children or teens or older adults. Thank you, product placement here. But it's <laughs> publications like this that just give us even more tools to work with the students that we choose to work with. And I've gone to conference workshop sessions on teaching older adults and and uh, there are a lot of resources there. So if I take the experience that I have and I'm always willing to learn new things that I can bring to these students and all of my students, it's just a win-win. Well, and I think an important moment to, this may be a thing tonight that I hadn't planned on, but I think as voice teachers who hang a shingle and take money to work with singing voices, if you find yourself even working with one aging voice, or as Dana will lead us to earlier, one child voice, you darn well better do a little bit of exploratory research about the special physiological needs of those singers and perhaps emotional needs of those singers. So I think we have to keep advocating in our profession because for, it, you know, I'm, we are not gonna go down the rabbit hole of certification or not tonight. So we have to, so we have to advocate for each other and within our profession continue to to hold a standard uh, kindly but to hold a standard in our own profession so apparently that's my little soapbox tonight moving on <laughs> jerry would you like to um to share a little we we talked about um benefits and challenges and both you and dana had some wonderful comments about that would you like to lead us in that direction yeah, absolutely you know when i you would ask you know are you a specialist in singing or, you know young tenors and baritones my answer i guess would be i've become one but it's not something that i sought to do and it's really not something i'm ever called myself so um it's happened and i think really what has happened is that the students and their performances have spoken to that and so the level at which they perform, the fact that they often get to national contests and things like that, have done all that speaking. And um, I will say that, that I've had to seek out specific training because as a primary, primarily classically trained singer, I studied with a voice teacher in college who was a student of Orrin Brown, who absolutely loved pedagogy and instilled that love in me. And so while I was pursuing my degree in vocal music education with the with the the goal was to be a high school choral director that was my thing 
I saw my choral director in high school do it and I thought, oh my gosh, what a life, that would be so much fun. And then I got in front of the group and had that discipline. And, and then I was sent to the room with a private student and thought, wow, this is so much easier. <laughs> so that's kind of why I went into that. But as I've, as I've been here in the Twin Cities, I, I came and then I was um, performed professionally for several years. And then I, I had a day job for most of those years. And it was um, about three years after I got married that my wife pretty much sat me down and said, your day job is killing you. You need to leave that day job. You come home after, I, I had always taught some private lessons, but never as a main income. And so in 2003, she encouraged me to hang out the shingle and go full time here. And it took a few years to build it, but I did. And what I found out very quickly was that the high schoolers who came to me were coming from a high school with a very strong music theater background. Mm. So I was getting students who were about to play Leeds and West Side Story and, and then a lot more contemporary musics, musical theater pieces. And I, I was sitting there going, okay, classical, tr classically trained teacher, it's time for you to seek out some help. That's when I joined Nats and um, started to seek out some of the resources that were available for teaching music theater. And I was really pleased in around 2012 where that, that focus to music theater and um, the contemporary stylings was focused even further so that those of us who were in the trend just teaching these kids who needed to have that pedagogical understanding of how to teach music theater instead of going by the seat of our pants and we were doing well and our students weren't hurting themselves. But on the other hand, I thought, what can I do better? I know I can do better for these kids. And that's when I started to seek out that additional training. Mm -hmm. Love it. Thank you for that. Dana, during the pre-chat, you had some wonderful points about um, the challenges in particular. You're welcome to share the benefits too of kind of specializing, but I would love for you to articulate some of the challenges you mentioned. Oh, yeah, some of the challenges that I mentioned is just, you know, kind of even what Cynthia was talking about that, you know, she's working with avocational adults and with high school. What did you say? You had about a third still in high school or, you know, yeah. And and so I think some of the challenges, you know, putting out your shingle saying, you know, kids, teaching kids is then other people might see you as, oh, well, she's that. So I'm an avocational adult, maybe um, she's just works with little kids. It's kind of like going to the pediatrician, right? High school kids, they don't want to go to go to the pediatrician. Um, they want to go to, you know, the, the big doctor or whatever. So I think that could be one of the challenges, you know, um, it hasn't necessarily been for me. I've been, you know, doing fine, but I, I see that it could potentially, you know, be a challenge. Um, so, yeah. And, and it doesn't, and I think what, what struck, struck me earlier is that just because you do end up spe having this particular specialty, specialty, like you said, it doesn't mean you only teach that. Right. It means that you have a particular interest and you have uh, for sure, I would, I hope, uh, not you, but others, sought out specialized training for you in particular, the children's voices, the developing yeah. voices, I mean, I think more and more, all of us are going to understand those fundamental changes as the voice evolves. But sure. um, yeah, but I, I think it doesn't mean that you're not working with other people. I, your point was that just uh, if you call yourself a specialist, people then can think, oh, you don't work with adults. You don't work sure. with high schoolers. It's just being careful in your branding, I guess, or, or you know, even, you know, with any, with any of us that are independent teachers, you know, we need to find where the clients are that we want to work with and we need to go find where they're at and reach out to them anyway. Like Jerry, you're in the high school, so you're, you're getting those clients. And so, you know, I go out and I, I actually get a lot of my private students because I do group classes. Um, I do small group and I do large group voice classes. And um, what kind of led me, that's how I kind of started working with kids because again, back on what some of us have been talking about and just, you know, the whole thing of discovery is 
I think we find our niche when we're willing to take on new experiences. And based on so many things that I've been doing, you know, a, a priest at my church asked me to start a children's choir. Oh, okay, I don't do that, but okay, sure, you know. And then when we moved, I've moved many times, so that's also had a lot to do with me finding my niche. But um, then I was, you know, in New Jersey, and I was asked to teach elementary school with my degree in performance. And so I had to, you know, learn all these things. And so then I started realizing that there was this underserved population of kids that wanted to take voice lessons. So I was like, well, I've done it in the classroom and with a choir. So I'm just going to teach like voice lessons, but in a large group because I've done that in a classroom. But that's actually been really helpful for me to find my clients because when I go out I teach a large group class here in our school district after school. I get like 18 kids, 15 to 18 kids that sign up for my class. And that's just a great, you know, I'm pulling all kinds of private students then that want to then pursue further. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a great way to, within your niche is to go and find, you know, where your clients are and where you, your future students and where you can, where you can find them those rocks that they're hiding underneath so and uh, pull them in <laughs> you know what percentage of your uh, on average across the year are children what percentage are children and what age is that specifically yeah that's a very good question so i and this is again you know very specific to me i like working I've just found that working um, from five ages five to 13 is what I constitute my child singer. Um, I'm working on a book right now um, that is really going to kind of go up to before they're really starting, you know, so it's pre puberty, you know. Um, of course, they're all starting puberty earlier and um, and those changes start coming. I, I hear it. I hear him changes in you know, nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds, you know, um, but I, I really, I enjoy working with kids starting at around age five kindergarten when they're starting to learn how to read, because that to me is that same time that they're just starting to formulate all of these wonderful connections of language. I love, I love teaching them text and, you know, just exploring text away from the songs and helping them to read you know they're not even reading yet but they're they're learning how to you know learn these songs so there there's some rote learning and there's a lot of that kind of stuff so for me 5 to 13 is kind of what i call my born to sing kids but your question was how many so right now all of my students are under the age of 14 um, but, you know, a year ago, I had a, several high school students and avocational. I have I have several amazing avocational students that I've worked with. I've always been in a college town. My husband's in a higher ed. And um, I've had the privilege of working with these amazing retired professors and judges. I've just had so many, you know, and I love working with those avocational adults. But like right now, they're just not there and I'm not going out and looking for them right. because I've got my hands full with this, right. but it's not to say I don't enjoy working with that age group, but I am just getting a lot of joy going back to what Jerry was saying. You know, I just get a lot of joy, you know, and again, when I work with children, one thing that I really like to drive home is that I'm not working with the elite child singer. My belief is that all children can learn to sing. So I've got some kids that they have hard time matching pitch. They can't find their head voice quite yet. Or they, you know, I, I believe that all children can sing and should be singing. I think this notion for years of sending children away, oh no, they're too young to take voice lessons. They should go learn piano or, you know, truth be told, all of my children started on the violin. And that's kind of how I ended up even working with children is seeing how, the Suzuki method is really designed that it wasn't the Suzuki method on violin was not by Shiniki Suzuki was not designed to make prodigies. It was that every child can learn to play the violin. Yeah. And I believe that all children can learn to sing. So most of the children that I'm working with 
are they're just kids wanting to sing. They're not on the elite track. They're not doing, you know, auditions and and that kind of stuff. They're just kids. Singing. This conversation makes me so this conversation makes me so happy because we are a profession of such diverse people with so many interests, right? And I it just brings me such joy to see people find their niche, to find something that is, uh, requires somebody special to do a particular task. You know, I just, that brings me great joy. Before I ask Jerry and Cynthia the same question, we're getting some um, comments that I just wanna read for a second and questions. Um, Michelle, first of all, says, to, love that Dana, yes, everyone can sing. And then Dan Mitten says, uh, Dana, you spoke about being careful about branding in terms of specializing while not cutting off potential clients outside your niche. How do you control how your brand rolls out in print, on social media, and in the minds of colleagues so that the right message travels through word of mouth? What are two quick examples of wording or strategy for how to carry this out? Thank you, Dan. It's a great question. That is a great question. Well, again, I, I guess I'm not, I'm, I'm not branding and going out and looking for the avocational adult student right now. Um, I do, enjoy working with that but again since i'm not applying that so much right now i have worked on my branding to make you know born to sing kids for kids and young adults so that kind of rolls in at least a little bit more um you know feeling that maybe like i said the kids aren't studying with the pediatrician <laughs> if they're 16 or 17 you know they don't feel like that um, so that's one example um, I don't know maybe you guys have some other input on on how you guys are branding Jerry or Cynthia why don't we pause and talk about this for a moment you know well, my... it's interesting go ahead I was just gonna say that the word specialist keeps coming up in the conversation and that's something I never call myself. Um, I just, I enjoy working with recreational adult students, avocational adult students. I use those terms interchangeably. Um, but I will say that if you are going to be working with particularly retirees or adults with flexible schedule, that is how, on a very practical sense, that is how you fill your daytime hours. Exactly. <laughs> When I was teaching at university and then you know, part-time and then had a home studio, I only had those after-school hours available and they were chock full of high school students. Once I had my own studio and um, I had this huge block of time during the day that I wanted to fill, um, guess who I filled that with? So if you do want to reach out to, to adult students, um, I highly recommend you have some daytime available. I start teaching voice lessons at 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning, and I usually have enough students to, to get me right through to a lunch break, and I have a, a break in the middle of the day, and then I start those, those after school and after work lessons at you know, 2.30, 3 o'clock. But I have been able to fill, it, fill up all of my morning times an early afternoon with adult students. So that's kind of nice too. Mm -hmm. And Jerry, how about you? Well, I, I have the luxury of being in this business for a while now, so I don't do any kind of advertising other than just really positive shout outs for my existing students when they have successes. Um, posting things on social media, on Instagram and on Facebook. I don't tweet, so I'm sure I, I I have a friend of mine who would probably like to see me doing that. Um, but it's uh, I, I kind of bite off as much as I can chew and really try to stay on top of the positive reinforcement for the students that I do have. And that's everybody from the high school to the young professional that's trying to get in the singer songwriter business and things like that. That's another little specialty that's been kind of emerging in the last few, few years and it's all word of mouth. And so, um, I think that value is just huge. If you treat your clients respectfully and and yourself respectfully in the way that they treat you, 
and have your policies um, set up in a way that that helps them understand that you are a business and that they can you know these are the hours you have available to teach if they're really looking for your specialty they will make those hours work and it took me years to realize that that was really tough and i know i'm kind of in a luxurious place for that because i don't feel like i'm in the beginning of the career where i'm looking for students they're coming to me from that word of mouth which is just a real blessing mm -hmm. I'm wondering if any of my colleagues, do you audition students to be in your studio? Because I don't, and people assume, oh, you're Cynthia Vaughn, you've been teaching forever. Right. Why have to have to audition to get it? No. No, Just the past year, I started having discovery sessions with new clients, um, and that is not about their talent level. Mm -hmm. um, I, I try to get a little take on who they are, who their personality is, if they're open to learning. Because I'm learning after many years and here you, you, we all know that person who comes in who already knows everything is not going to be open to, to accepting any criticism or trying anything in a new way. And so I just initiated that last year and there's only been one out of probably a dozen that I've seen since initiating that, that I chose to, to refer out. Um, but it's not a talent thing for me. It never has been because I, my greatest success story is not the student with the multi-platinum record. It is the student who came to me nearly tone deaf, who got in a concert choir his senior year. Yeah. You know, the one, people, who's that greatest success story? And that's, for me, that is the kiddo right there. He comes to mind, I'll never forget his name. Andy Campbell, if you're out there, I remember you. <laughs> I, so so I really question. think that's an important yeah. thing, you know? I, I'm the same. I don't audition. I never have. I, I'm almost one of those crazy people that it's like, I like the challenge, you know, um, that student that comes and you're like, oh, boy, this is going to be a tough one. And like you, you know, you just those small little achievements that they make that shy singer that refuses to ever sing in front of anybody that maybe actually sang in the studio recital. That's just a big accomplishment. And one thing that I did add this last summer to my website as I was just redoing my website is I added a um, questionnaire. And because I'm working with children, one of my main big things is that the parents have to be involved. And so that is one of the things with working with children. And I think it's maybe one that has caused this stigma of why we don't work with children because there's this image of the stage parent. So I do have some questions that just kind of can lead the parent to seeing how I teach, what I teach, what I'm, so I have some questions that I, um, that they have to submit, you know, as, um, as just an inquiry for me, which just gives me a little background. So, cause I don't want those kids that the mom is coming and pushing them and just wants them to be um, auditioning for American Idol. That is something that I, you know, I'm always willing to take the challenge, but it's not my preferred client or student that I'm looking to work with. I don't you know. Just, intake I'm, form? Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I was wondering, Dana, if you put that into your intake form when people are registering via website or how do you yes, get that in? a type form on my website. Yeah, you can check it out. <laughs> I get that follow-up email. The registration form, online registration form, is pretty pretty straightforward. It's mostly contact information. But when I do the follow-up, usually email. Sometimes it's a it's a phone call, but um, usually the first contact is an email, and and it's like, tell me about yourself. What what are your your goals for sing? What's your experience? What are your goals for singing lessons, if any? And most of the time, I get an essay back. I get a lot of information, and that's enough information for me to know whether this is going to be a, a good good fit or not. And they're passionate, and they're passionate about it. If they're writing that long, right, they're passionate. <laughs> yeah, rarely will someone say, oh, I just want to learn to sing better. That I don't think that's ever happened. They, they really will give me a story. And isn't that what we're doing? Isn't that what we're trying to, to pull out of them is what is their story and how are they going to use their voice to say that? And I have to just 
piggyback again on Jerry's comment. Um, you're just sparking all kinds of memories. Oh. I will <laughs> never forget the adult student. I was when I was in Chicago, and an adult student, a businessman, came to me, and he wanted to take singing lessons so that he could surprise his wife by singing happy birthday to her. Mm -hmm. And he told me over the phone that he says, he says, you know, I, my family makes fun of me, and, and they say I just couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. And I'm like, ah, oh, ha, ha, you know, come, come sing for me. Oh, uh, I've never had a student who had such um, difficulty matching pitch. And, and so it was actually one of the ways that I learned to help future students matching pitch, but he could not find my pitch anyway. Piano, my voice, I had him sing a note, and then I had to sort of figure out what note it was. Uh, you know, he sang a sort of pitch. I found the closest thing I could on the piano. We we gave it a name. We called it One, because this man um, was a businessman and an engineer, and he could understand spatial relationship. We called that One. One, one, one. We started. We spent a whole lesson with him just singing One. The next week we did One, Two, One. And when eventually, after many weeks, he could sing five notes and six notes and, and just on the numbers, eventually he could match pitch. And he, we recorded him singing happy birthday to his wife just in case the nerves got to him and he wouldn't be able to do it. And so he had a cassette, gave him the cassette tape. This is how long ago it was. <laughs> and he called me back next week and, and, yeah, I'm going to cry telling you the story. Yeah, he sang happy birthday to his wife for the first time ever. She burst into tears. He burst into tears. and But he sang it for her live, and, and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he never came back for another lesson, and that's okay. Somewhere um, in a drawer, in a sock drawer, there is a cassette tape of him singing happy birthday to his wife, and it's probably one of her most treasured possessions. I love that. I think those stories are so important because I think every voice teacher, those are the stories. If you ask them the most memorable student, it would be my student saying at Seattle Symphony or it's, you know, it's the small victories that have such significance. I think that's wonderful. Let, um, we're getting some um, more questions, so I really want to honor my attendees. Um, so we're going to back up a little in our conversation. Ray Myra says, in regards to the audition topic, for me, I tell all the students that the initial lesson can be a trial lesson because they may not like the way I work or I, or I may feel I don't have the tools or more specifically the language to help them move forward. So that's another, um, I, it's funny, the word, I'm interested, Ray, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, but um, trial lesson, I hate that. When people at the university, they email, can I have a trial lesson? And it just, it's like nails on a chalkboard. So that's my own little hang up. Jerry, you earlier said discovery lesson. Yes, yeah, that's a stolen term. I wish I could remember who, from whom I stole it, I would attribute it, but I loved yeah. that term. I'm sure it was someone in the Speakeasy Cooperative. Yeah, um, and, but and it, it was a beautiful thing. I, her comment is not about trial. I'm sorry to yeah. have it hold that, but that, I don't know why other people have that reaction, Cynthia or, or Dana. There's something about that term. No, I, I don't, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think you can do it in one lesson. <laughs> yeah. Right. Go ahead, Cynthia. I'm talking over Dana and I didn't hear her comment. Oh, I just said, I, I don't think I could adequately give everything in one lesson to, you know, I, I don't, and, and I, periodically I hear people on the forums talk about, you know, not only the trial lesson, but giving the free trial lesson. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, my time is my time. I don't get to go to the doctor for free just to ch check them out. You know, it's, I don't, yeah. That's, you know. An, that's a very personal decision. I see posts on that on Facebook. And I do think it's a very personal decision. Uh, um, to make Michelle says she called Michelle Marquart DeVos calls it um, an initial fit lesson. Mm -hmm. So there's another. And by the way, Cynthia Mary McCurtry says, "What a lovely story, story, Cynthia. I'm enjoying happy tears now. How inspiring!" Um, yeah. I just have my uh, 
my take on on trial lessons or sample lessons or fit lessons, and I, I've had this discussion with other teachers, but my personal preference is that that puts too much pressure on me and to the student to, to have to prove something in that first lesson. And I think I get the information I need from that initial email conversation or phone conversation, and I want a student to give me at least six weeks. I wouldn't go to um, a sewing instructor and say, show me how to show me make me a dress show me how to make myself a dress you have an hour <laughs> you want to to work with that student through that process and and if at the end of six or 12 lessons if it's not working um we'll happily go our separate ways but uh i i just think that's too much pressure to have to prove myself in one lesson and i'm not going to do it um, D. Bruce Moore agrees. He says, my students must pay for six lessons. They can decide oh, yeah. that and I can prefer that. And I guess at, the, at that, for me, that term comes at the university because people will say, can I have a trial lesson? And then, of course, it is a one-shot deal whilst they're in town for the audition. That's uh -huh. like best Robins. I'll try I, that and that and that. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> I'm trying to train my colleagues. Please don't call it that, but, you know. We have bigger fish to fry. Uh, somebody else, let's see, Amy Wood says, I agree, Cynthia, I asked students to commit to at least six to see if it will fit. Let's get through, um, oh, only referred, uh, and Dee Bruce Moore uh, says, oh, he only referred out twice in 12 years. <laughs> so he has the six, the trial of six, and, and that hasn't um, been an issue. Um, and Ray, it, Myra is responding to my, I understand the verbiage. For me, it's about personality working together, not about being able to teach them everything in one lesson. I have a very strong personality and I know that is a turnoff for some folks. So it has nothing to do with how much I can teach in a lesson. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, that's, and you're, I love that you're framing it about, um, you know, you're trying to see if they're a good fit. Um, let's see, there's a couple more that are, thanks guys, you're, you're popping in now, I love it, thank you. Um, Michelle Marquardt DeVoe again says, there are so many very cool ways to learn what we need to know to continue to work with someone. I love all the different ways we can work with those we choose. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Private message. Um, Nancy Walker says, hi all, I do a consult where I demo how I work and I might ask a student to sing a pitch pattern with me on the piano, but I don't subscribe to free lessons. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe when you're a younger teacher starting out, you might feel, you know, more inclined to do that. So I definitely think if pe that's people's choice to run their business, Michelle might disagree with me on that, but um, I think we get to choose. Let's see, Kristen asks, Ah, do most of the teachers here draw from urban populations? Has anyone approached a niche from a rural perspective? Yeah. Um, and if there are any attendees on that would like to speak to this, please, you can either raise your hand and I'll turn your microphone on or type in the question box to me and I can see that. But Dana, it looks like you had a... Yeah, actually, my whole Born to Sing Kids, I said like my group classes, so we were living in rural Ohio. We were at Miami of Ohio, cornfields all around. <laughs> a good hour drive through cornfields to get out. And uh, the kids were not, they did not have, you know, you know, you had the professor's kids and you had then the kids that were rural kids and they didn't have the opportunity. And that was another reason for me why I started a voice class, a voice class um, for kids is a very affordable way for a parent to sign up for, you know, a 10 week session for $150 instead of voice lessons. So it was really a wonderful opportunity to, I loved giving that to the community that we lived in because, and then that's why I had so many kids when I first started it, because these kids, they didn't, they, they didn't have any place else to go. And we had a community arts center there. And so, yeah, it was actually, in some ways it was easier to get students there than it is in this very urban area that I'm in now, because the kids now are way overbooked. Kids are doing everything. It's so hard to schedule them. And 
um, it's actually sometimes harder to find them in a big um, big urban area than it is in a rural area. Hmm. Interesting. My studio is suburban. Um, it's Tri Cities, Washington. I, I couldn't call it urban, but it's also not rural. It's just yeah. a big population of 350,000 people in a in suburbia. And mine is uh, similar. Mine is similar. Yeah. I'm in a western suburb of Minneapolis, near Minnetonka. I think about a 500,000 population within this probably five to 10 mile radius here. Yeah. And Jerry, I think you said this in the pre-chat, not during, well, whilst we've been live, but you mentioned mm -hmm. you go on campus and teach I, on site, which I think I, I do, um, that. And that's not my primary. My primary Ellsburn Voice Studio is um, here in my studio behind me. Um, and it's a private entrance in my home in Shorewood, Minnesota. And I have probably about 30 registered students. Not all are weekly. I do offer an every other week option for some students. Um, and then on two mornings of the week, on Thursdays and Fridays, I travel to a high school about a half hour north of me um, called Wyzetta High School. And I teach there on campus where we take the kids out of the high school classroom during their choir hour for private lessons for a half hour each. They have block periods, which are alternating days. So there's a 90 minute block where I can get three kids out of each choir for half hour lessons. And they pay through an e-pay system online. And then I'm actually a private, um, I'm a part-time school district employee because that with Minnesota law is how they have to do it in order to have that program within the school grounds during school hours. I know with, I used to do that at a private school many, many years ago. And with private schools, and maybe it's changed now, but um, you, you didn't need to go through those kinds of hoops. It was very different. But same thing, you could be on campus and take the kids out during choir, or some of them could get out of um, lunch. Photo, yeah, lunch, or what's the where the photo album thing, yearbook? They could get out sure. of the yearbook. <laughs> or, you know, there were certain classes that they could get out of. Um, and it was also, I found a great time to give group lessons for them to try. Um, take three or four out of choir at once and um, then they didn't have as much pressure on them and they got to explore it and then they would move into the private studio later. So I think there's some wonderful opportunities to go on site um, on schools. I wanted uh, to, oh sorry. If there's time, I wanted to just quickly say something about, especially for older adult singers, um, just the benefits and also some of the challenges from the teaching studio. And, and I'll make this quick, but we know we're learning more and more about the benefits that um, older adults singing, it's, it's helping breathing. There's a big plus for um, just brain, just uh, brain games and and hopefully perhaps staving, staving off some dementia, but just keeping your brain active and learning and reading music and also hearing. Um, I, as a voice teacher, I may be, the first person that that notices and mentions a noticeable hearing loss in an older student, older adult student, and they will have that checked out and and come back with you know hearing aids. Um, there's a social aspect to this. A lot of older adults, um, especially once the children are grown and gone, find themselves with a lot of time on their own. And so this is uh, one student said that. Uh, she just felt like just staying home in bed, but it was Wednesday and she said knowing she had a singing lesson She got out of bed. She took a shower. She got dressed She got herself to her voice lesson to get herself out of the house. So it was actually helping her with her uh, depression and um, it, We all know that singing just it's, it's the dopamine. It just it's a happy drug um, and it's and so that's a very positive effect but as a teacher, if you are going to work with uh, particularly older adults, um, be prepared for health challenges that may crop up with your students. Some of those are hearing, some of them might be vision. And what accommodations are you going to make? Um, are you going to print out some large, uh, large print scores? Um, mm -hmm. is your, my studio happens to be handicapped accessible. If someone needs to come in with a cane or a walker, I mean, they can get in. It's all on the ground level. 
Um, but I also find a big thing for my late middle-aged adult students is that even though this is the time they can finally pursue their music, many times they have to give it up for a season because they are now caring for older parents. And that's been a big thing that I've seen time and time again. And I just have to say, I understand, take this time, go, go be with your mom, do what you need to do, and I hope to see you back in the future. And they're just, that sandwich generation is just really torn. So just be prepared for some of those things. And there are some heartaches. Um, if you if you teach older adult students, you will have a student who dies. Mm. Well, if you teach teenagers, that may happen too. Mm. But it's just, it's part of life. It's circle of life. If I might uh, piggyback on that, Mari. Yes, yes, please, Mary. I feel your heart, Cynthia. It's a beautiful thing. Um, working with high school students, kind of knowing who you're working with too, one of the biggest challenges that I see um, are that kids, I mean, most of us, if we've ever been in sports, when were you in sports? You were in sports in high school, right? So I, I think one of the things and one of the reasons why I've been very successful is that I really try to meet that individual person, personality and body because they bring in the different um, the different tensions from the different sports. If you've got a hockey player who's got very extreme external obliques and twists every time he thinks to breathe or exhale, you better know kind of what to be looking for. When you've got um, people that are in many different kinds of sports carry different sorts of tension with them, the shoulder tension of the tennis player, for example. Um, it's, it's, I think, one of the things that we all need to be aware of is that in that time of life, if you're working with those kids during that specific time of life, to understand that there's there's a need for you to understand physiology and um, some of those things and how they interact with the way your body works and how that works pedagogically for them. And that's part of my intake form and why I usually try to get a parent in the room with me to get some background, whether or not they had you know tubes as a kid, if they've had their hearing checked, I had a student just this this week, or not this week, but who started the summer, a 15-year-old who stood in front of me and I went, oh my goodness, his larynx was tilted in his neck, and one hip was about an inch and a half higher than the other, and I asked his mother if he'd been scanned and, and screened for scoliosis. And she said, no, you know what, I think he was sick during gym that day in middle school. And so... I recommended that they had a doctor's appointment that week, and I said, will you please have that physician check out his spine? Sure enough, he's got 39% scoliosis in his, in his lumbar and thoracic mm -hmm. joints and extremely curved in the back of his neck. He's now in a back brace and will be for the next two years to try to help that curvature. So I think it's really important that um, when we're working with high schoolers in particular to kind of understand what their background is, how they're using their bodies, and just to pay attention to them because they may very well be going through a growth spurt at any moment, um, how to help them get through that. If you've got somebody who has, who is going through a voice change or is um, just recently through a voice change, being sensitive to that and understanding that they too, like Cynthia, you when you said this earlier, how, how they're dealing, your older students are dealing with a voice that has changed significantly and some of the pain and the, and the looking for what used to be is there. So is that super talented young man who was a soprano last week and now suddenly is two and a half inches, you know, taller and, and dropping two and a half octaves and going, what's happening? And trying to give them the patience to get through that, that change and that you got to know the things to help them through it. And a lot of times that's being the listening ear it truly is it's it's being that person to be their advocate and to say i hear you i understand this is so frustrating because right now in their life and i think this is important for all of us to to um to realize no matter who we teach what age bracket that we are there with them at that moment in their life 
-hmm. you know, that we're, we're meeting them where they are, we're meeting them where, where their challenges are. And we can easily as adults sit and talk to them and say, you're in high school, it's going to be just fine. Hey, you'll look back on this and laugh on it someday. But that someday is not now. That's right now. Everything that they're going through is the most important thing in their life right now. And I think it's really crucial for us as adults to help them see that and to help them to help to guide them through. And um, I could get into a whole can of worms with the perfectionist, but um, trying to help them to understand um, it's OK if everything's not perfect because they're trying to get that 30 plus on the ACT. They're trying to do their advanced placement and their IB work and they're trying to make themselves stand out among the crowd so that they can get into that choice college and everything else. There's a whole set of challenges that comes with dealing with high schoolers successfully and um, I think you have to be able to be that person who can be there in the moment with them. Mm -hmm. And that's the case for the children or the the older adult, isn't it? I mean yeah. we are so privileged to do what we do. I know as you're talking, Jerry, I'm thinking of that 60-year-old singer for me who's come through the medical community with some specific voice issues. But, you know, she still has a beautiful voice and she still wants to work with this voice. And um, it's such an important part of their identity at any age, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I think that's, it's so, we are so lucky to do what we do. Let me just, as we're at the top of our hour, I want to make sure everybody feels heard, including my dog who's barking downstairs. So if you hear him, <laughs> well, Oliver yeah. has an unmet need, so he just has to wait a minute. Um, <laughs> Heather Purvis says, Cynthia, you are a gem, for which I would echo that sentiment. And when we were discussing earlier about um, free lessons or not, Michelle wrote in, Michelle Mark Ortevo wrote, no, I, she 100% agrees that we all need to run our business our way. When it's not working, that's when change is needed. So there's no wrong or right, just weak or strong for the individual teacher. And, you know, I want to see more of that in our profession, that not judging and more, we all can create our own niche. We all can create what works for us in our life with our business. Um, and two more, um, clear back, Jeff Costello, please forgive me because at 620 when Jerry was speaking, he said, it's so important for graduates of classical programs, basically all of us to seek out training in contemporary styles if we are going to teach them. And yeah. that to me seems so such old news, but I still see so many classical teachers teaching belt aesthetic without specialized training and you know, just because you've had a career or have studied your whole life, you know, doesn't, I'm not qualified to reach to teach children. It's not something that I have sought special training for. So I want to encourage everybody to please stay in their lane and or find a mentor to help guide you if you want to change lanes. Um, <laughs> uh, Larissa Fraser, very informative webinar and thank you. So, um, People are giving us wonderful comments. Karen Brunson, current Nats president, says three wonderful guests, and I love hearing about the different vocal issues at different points of life. So I would just, you guys have, um, I don't know, there's just something about tonight and the three of you where, you know, I'm both an independent teacher and a university teacher, full time both. So I, I have a, a very, I see 70 students, different people across every two weeks, um, anywhere from injured to graduates to professionals to, a few teenagers and um, so as an independent teacher myself I just what we do is extraordinary because we are all generalists really right we don't in some ways and then we find our niches within that generalist but what we do as independent teachers we just are changing the world I really believe that and um, so I so appreciate you guys sharing your thoughts with us tonight and your expertise and um, as we close out, let me just say we're getting lots of thank yous. So just know that those are coming in. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind Nats Chatters, our next chat will be Sunday, November 10th. With, and it will be Motor Learning Part 2. Uh, many of you will remember last year's very, very popular Nats chat with Lynn uh, Helding, Lynn A, Lynn, Lynn and Lynn Maxville, Lynn M. And if you haven't watched last year's Nats chat, please do so and you'll understand that little funny joke. 
it will be part two focus focus locus hocus pocus <laughs> I love that was lynn helding's clever title of course so i look forward to that sunday november 10th and jerry dana and cynthia thank you so much it's been an honor and a privilege thank, thank you. you and good night nats chatters and if my uh, guests if you want to stay on just for a moment we'll say goodbye to everyone else and you can hang out with us is that all right okay all right good night everyone Bye, everybody. <laughs> Sign off now. Thank you.